I must acting commissioner of police Clifton Hicken today laid to rest claims that his deputy commissioner of police acting Calvin Butos is on the investigation by the special organized crime unit. Hicken spoke with reporters on the sidelines of the first legal conference on criminal justice reform at the Marriott Hotel in Georgetown. It's, it's about Mr. Please. Butos and the, the multi-million dollar deposits. Is call it true me. or not? No, it's not true. And I made a release already to our system. You didn't see that? Yeah, I made a release. It's in the system. There was no investigation going on whatsoever. And no Please. deposits? Nothing whatsoever. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Butos, who served as the force admin officer, was transferred to Special Branch, while Deputy Commissioner Provincial Dat Budram is now in charge of administration, while the head of the Special Branch Assistant Commissioner Errol Watts is now in charge of operations. In a statement from the police, it said that the move is part of the modernization plan for the Guyana Police Force. Part of the modernization plan for the Guyana Police Force. That is what these lying people said. When they, they knew, the kid knew, according to Brutus in a, in a um, subsequent affidavit, he knew at the time when he made that statement, he knew that he was being, Brutus was being investigated for financial irregularities. Brutus claimed that he, um, Ikin told him that he was instructed by cabinet, he Ikin was instructed by cabinet to send him on leave pending the outcome of this investigation. Immediately, right? Brutus said so in an affidavit. So then Ikin telling the world, and what happened? Nothing happened. He's sitting down there still as the acting commissioner, liar, big man. As we continue, we say lying people, not on truth or being less than candid. He's telling a blatant lie, caught in a blatant lie, and nothing happened. So, yes, the man is charged to, to, and, in, in October 24th, on October 24th, 30 charges read to him, money laundering, money laundering for senior police officer, thief in, what they call last year, my public officer, fancy phrase for thief in. They claim that he's thief. Um, $60 million from the police credit union. The, that, sorry, not the credit union, the police consumer squad. They also say thief another $20 million from there. So total $80 something million from that place. The welfare fund, 13 point something million dollars. They say he lick up there and he lick up all over. ACP Calvin Brutus granted $10 million bail on new liability charges. Assistant Commissioner of Police and Attorney at Law Calvin Brutus was granted bail in the sum of $10,150,000 today on 2-1 additional charges of liability of an officer. The matters were called before Acting Chief Magistrate Faith McGusty at the Georgetown Magistrates' Courts. These allegations add to his growing list of legal woes. This latest development follows previous charges leveled against 44-year-old Brutus last month, including money laundering, misconduct in public office and larceny by a public officer. These cases involve the alleged misappropriation of over $800 million during his time in office as Deputy Commissioner of Police for Administration. Prosecutors claim Brutus used his position to funnel public funds into questionable projects, with a significant portion allegedly siphoned off for personal gain in bank accounts belonging to his 25-year-old wife and four-year-old son. Brutus has maintained his innocence insisting that the allegations are trumped up. Brutus, who is being represented by a battery of lawyers, is set to return to court next month for further proceedings. Crime Chief Wendell Blanham has stated that the Guyana Police Force, GPF, is transforming intelligence information into evidence in order to locate Joshua David and Delon Alexander, who it is hoped are still alive, despite the fact that the information does not point to a positive outcome. Ezoic. Lanham emphasized that after a person's disappearance, it must be one year and a day before the person is presumed dead. The crime chief told reporters that the intelligence information, which cannot be disclosed at this time, does not suggest anything favorable. The GPF is also working with sources, he added. Lanham said they are hoping that the information that was disseminated to them is untrue and that the men are alive. All manner of things, the police connection to these folks, who are wanted, and I'm not saying that these five guys are the ones who are wanted. The police got to know who these guys work for. The police got to know who these guys work for and why they have to protect these guys. So they only put this wanted bulletin out for these chaps only because 
they are supposed to they're supposed to be the ones in this video here when this guy the kidnapped victim we saw everything live and direct and this happened a stone throw away from where Irfan temporarily lives at State House. Take a look again. Kidnapped the guy, and that's the end of him. After his phone was detected, the last detection of his phone was in Buxton. Four persons, including a teenager, are currently in police custody over the murder of a 40-year-old chainsaw operator, Davinon Hosea, who was stabbed to death after a brawl at a So Stike East Bank Demerara Bar. The incident occurred at about a 1.35 today. According to police reports, Hosea, a resident of Hillfoot squatting area on the So Stike Linden Highway, had been consuming alcohol Saturday evening with his reputed wife and his brother, Levon Hosea, a Chinese restaurant at Coverden, EBD. The brother told investigators that he left the couple and went home. He then received a call from his brother at around 21 to meet him at the Ragu Sports Bar, located on the Solzdijk Public Road. On arrival, the brothers purchased alcoholic beverages. Davonin then told his brother that a group of men at the bar were looking at him. The men subsequently approached Davonin, grabbed hold of him in the presence of Levon, and relieved him of his valuables. As a result, Levon confronted the suspects, and a brawl ensued at the bar. The brothers managed to escape by running through Shawnee Gas Station, located at the Sozdike Public Road to the south of Raghu Sports Bar, which led to a track behind the gas station. The brothers were pursued by the perpetrators, who managed to catch up with Davinon, which ended up in a scuffle. Levon intervened and told his brother to run east along the track as two men pursued them. Levon stated that he ran in a different direction from Davinon, Levon went on to say that when he saw his brother again, he observed blood on the chest area of his t-shirt. Davinon had collapsed on the Hillfoot Sostike Linden Highway. According to police, Davonin's body was examined and stab wounds were seen on the right side of his face, on the left side of his abdomen, at the center of his chest, and on the right side of his chest. All stab wounds were measured at one inch and a half. The body of Davonin Hosea was then escorted to the Diamond Diagnostic Center, where he was seen and medically examined by a doctor who pronounced him dead on arrival. The body was later escorted to the Memorial Gardens Funeral Home, awaiting a post-mortem examination. At around 6 Halder Seas this morning, the CCTV footage was viewed at Ragu Sports Bar at Sozdike, where several persons were seen fighting with the now-deceased man. Based on an intelligence-led operation, Kevin Granstuart, 24, of Victory Valley Road, Timehri, was arrested with a black Rambo, who was found with the dead man's cell phone. They were all placed into custody, assisting with the investigation. Here's one last thing. We're, we're opposed to this. The city council giving waiver to this GTNT, these foreign companies, for their rates and taxes. It's, it's ridiculous. They claim they don't have money. These are, are, are big companies. They have huge assets here. They're selling their assets, making millions, tens of millions of US dollars in Ghana. They should pay their fair share of taxes at the city council. Why do you have to give a foreign company that's flush with cash from selling their properties here that they got as part of the deal that APNU made with them in, in 1990? Um, and you're giving them waivers. It's ridiculous. And this, and, and nobody pays attention. What about the six billion dollars that APNU owns? If if it had been or PNC owes the city council, that disappeared. J trust me. Had it been the PPP, and I keep saying this every day, every single day, the Starbuck news or the Kaicho news would have been on our case every single day every single day about decency in government and all of that not a word about it they don't write about it they don't even write much about this they're going to give the mayor to explain some nonsense we've made it clear if you're giving you have a policy to give a waiver then it must be a stated policy people must not come into anyone's office there to negotiate a waiver that's when money gets funneled to individuals and to Congress place. That's how they raise money. Have a policy, announce it for everyone, and then they just go. It's applied when they pay their bill. 
and and i believe that foreign companies should be excluded from any way of, of any of these things the foreign owned companies why should we be giving rich foreign companies that make a ton of money waiver of their taxes in the city alfred mentor has called out the government of guyana goji for what he sees as preferential treatment of foreign companies particularly in the oil and gas sector when it comes to granting tax concessions and incentives he made the aforementioned statement in his response to criticism received from the government in relation to a 25% waiver granted by the city council to the guyana telephone and telegraph company gtt now rebranded as one communications mentor argues that while multinational corporations enjoy significant tax breaks and other benefits when investing in diana local businesses especially those outside the government's favored corporate class are denied similar support while it has consistently been willing to grant major tax breaks and concessions to foreign companies especially those in the oil and gas sector when it comes to local businesses particularly those that are not part of the government's preferred corporate class it seems to act with a different set of rules, the mayor wrote in his letter. Foreign companies, including those in the lucrative oil and gas industry, often receive various incentives from the government. These include generous tax breaks, import duty exemptions, and other financial concessions aimed at encouraging investment and boosting economic growth. The 2022 and 2023 Auditor General's reports highlight the revenue collected from the oil and gas sector, as well as the extensive tax exemptions granted to it. According to the 2022 report, the oil and gas sector generated $86.27 billion in tax revenue, accounting for 28.6% of the total revenue collected by the Guyana Revenue Authority GRA. This revenue was split between $80.711 billion from internal revenue and $5.496 billion from customs. Recognizing both the challenges and efforts to rebuild the country's sugar industry, President Dr. Irfan Ali has underscored the government's commitment to long-term success despite facing significant hurdles. The head of state during his inaugural In the Seat media engagement last week stated that the continued investments in the Guyana Sugar Corporation, Guy Suco, is aimed at making the industry economically viable, but Guyanese must be reminded of the deplorable state of the sugar industry prior to the People's Progressive Party, Civic, PP administration. One must remember what we inherited when we came into office, he said. The fields were left abandoned, even the canals, big trees were in all the canals, all the ponds were rotted. There was no dam, it was like a forest. So, we had to build back from the field, then we had to build back from all the factories, he explained. He highlighted that rebuilding the sugar industry is a step-by-step -step process, requiring not only physical infrastructure, but a transformation in the industry's culture and workforce. We can address Kaisuko holistically because I want to have the, the, the management. But one must, one must uh, remember what we inherited. When we came in the office, within the first week I went to one of the plantations. When I looked in the fields, I said to Minister Zolfi, this is going to take tremendous effort. Because the fields were left abandoned. So even in the canals, big trees were in all the canals. All the ponds were rotten. There was no dam. It was like a forest. So we had to build back from the field. Then we had to build back all the factories. Remember, the factories were left. So now is the process of rebuilding. Now they're at, uh, this year, there are about uh, 40,000 tons, just over 40,000 tons and they expect to grind until late December. Because the cane is in the field. Remember, we went on a mechanization project and we were able to plant uh, a greater acreage of, of cane. The first crop next year would have enough cane coming to the system. Then what they had was um, a number of parts for the factories. So you have a lot of factory downtime now. And when we go in depth, I will give you the full analysis. You have a lot of factory downtime because there was no maintenance of the factory, there was no spare replacement, they did not keep spares. So we have to now go back, get spares to come in for existing operation, and then bring in uh, additional spares to keep the operation going. But more than that, whilst they come and ask for this supplementary expenditure for Gaisuko, 
during the months of April to July, them banners this take out $4.02 billion for Gaisuko. They didn't come to Parliament for it. They come afterwards after they take it out. So you get mm -hmm. a $3 billion, one supplementary for current, a $2.5 billion as a supplementary for capital, a $4 billion for what you call contingency. They bill away the money out of the treasury onto themselves at Gaisuko without asking permission. They could do it, but they got to go report to us. So when they come for this supplementary, they reported to us that they had taken out $4 billion. So for this year alone, January, that the, the budget time, $6 billion. Then $4 billion in contingency. Then three point five, and then 3.2, and then a 2.3 as for the current. So this is, you know, 10 and 5, almost $16 billion. Six and it is a lot of money. But what Correct. I have calculated over the years, yeah, it is coming up to about $40 billion since they got into government. And not one of these years has Gaisuko made a profit. None. Wow. As a matter of fact, last year, I think it made a loss of some $7.8 billion. Oh, sorry, 2021, $7.8 billion. And then I think in 2022, $10.2 billion. Um, and then last year, again, a big set of losses. And this year, they come for almost $16 billion. And this is what we have now.